Welcome back. Uh, we're watching Commodity Champions. I'm Anisha Gupta. And what will 2023 look like for the commodity space? What are the key events to look at while planning your portfolio? To answer all of these questions, I am now joined by Edward Morse, Managing Director and Head of Commodities Research at City. Ed, hi. Such a pleasure to have you. I want to start uh, uh, asking you about the price view that you would have on the energy space. So whether it's about crude oil or natural gas, what's your sense on these? Well, we think that they're going to remain volatile, um, maybe not quite as volatile as last year, but still volatile on a short-term basis. And that uh, is a result of several factors. Uh, the first one, I would say, is a significant lack of liquidity in uh, futures and options markets, which means that uh, we see sell-offs, we see buying that's very erratic, and we can have one or two firms enter the market in a big way and if they have a big position for themselves and there's not a lot, enough liquidity to absorb whether they're selling or whether they're buying. Uh, and we then see prices going down by $5 or more or up $5 or more. We don't see that changing anytime soon. The second factor involved in uh, the volatility is of course, the really significant lack of inventories in the world. So that when we have seasonal changes, uh, and we have uh, changes uh, that are impacted, especially by weather. We have a greater uh, volatility because of a lack of cushions that are in the market. Uh, and uh, a third factor is the weather itself. Uh, and that's because uh, ever since the late 1990s, uh, excuse me, ever since the late 2019, 2020 period, uh, we've seen the global gas market become a global market. It used to be a fragmented market. It was fragmented in part because uh, underlying gas is an inability or an expense of transporting it from one place to another. Even more restrictive were destination restrictions that were imposed in most of the first three decades of LNG. Uh, and that's because these projects are so expensive in terms of both liquefaction capital required and regasification capital required. And then enter the United States, uh, which by the end of the last decade became the largest LNG exporting country in the world. And the US has rules against destination restrictions, which has allowed, uh, which has allowed uh, natural gas to move from one place to another on a spot basis uh, whenever there is a shortage one place or another. So uh, we will have undoubtedly weather affecting the natural gas markets far more than affecting other markets and they'll be rippling around the world if we have a uh, a polar vortex in europe for example we can see current prices which are uh, in terms of dollars per million btus around six or five in the united states uh and, and around uh 23 or so in uh 25 in europe and a little over 30 in the Asian markets at the moment. The European market is getting tighter with colder weather. If we have a polar vortex, we could see on a BTU basis, uh, gas going up to $60 per million BTUs or e even higher, 10 times where they were at the beginning of 2021, three times or so higher than now. Um, and uh, we think there'll be much more volatility in the gas markets. Oh, clearly, uh, crude and gas both continue to be quite volatile, but we understand those ranges that you've told us. I also want to talk to you about the gold prices, which in the last quarter of the year have seen a bit of a rebound. Would you advise allocating funds for this in the new year? And what's your sense on prices? We actually think that um, when we get to an easing of central bank tightening, then gold will see its day. Uh, and uh, the increase we saw when gold reverted back up above uh, $1,800 an ounce uh, not so long ago, that coincided with a fall in the value of the U.S. dollar, DXY, went from about uh, 110 to an index of around 102. Uh, and then uh, the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, despite the skeptics who said they were going to slow down rate increases, did not do that. Uh, and we don't think they're going to slow down until they get to a higher level. So we think gold will be bouncy until uh, until the central bank, and particularly the U.S. central bank, slows down and stops its rate increases, at which point we think gold will be on a rebound. And we think that 
a gold will likely exceed the $1,900 an ounce level by the end of the year uh, and higher than that in uh, 2024. Okay. So gold prices can stay around $1,800 per ounce, but what about silver? Because this has seen a big range as well. Do you see industrial demand support prices in the new year? Well, silver is kind of funny. It's neither a pure industrial metal nor a pure a precious metal substitute for gold. So it responds both to the way gold is responding and it responds to uh, industrial production. We don't see any massive increase in industrial production uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, we see a continued slowdown of it in the US uh, the two stars of the world in terms of growth of industrial demand in the year might be in Asia, might be China and India, but uh, in in China, the rebound is not going to be in the first quarter. Uh, there are too many uh, headwinds, including the continued uh, evidence of uh, COVID itself ramping up, even as the lockdowns are easing. So uh, to the degree there would be an industrial rebound, it's likely to be the latter part of the year rather than before then, um, and uh, more likely to be, as I said, uh, in East and South Asia than in either Europe or North America. All right, at least there is some hope in the second half of next year. Also, steel and iron ore prices have seen support on China, stimulus uh, injections. Your sense on all of these commodities in 2023? Well, a sense on commodities in 2023 is going to be very divergent from one another. Uh, we think that, um, unlike some others, that we're not entering a commodity super cycle. We think, unlike others, uh, the evidence is overwhelming that uh, the cost structure of the industry uh, for oil and gas is such that uh, even at these prices, there's an encouragement of a new investment. We think the new investment is adequate. Uh, you mentioned iron ore, where we've raised our prices recently. Uh, that has to do in particular with the status of inventories around the world. Uh, China starting to ramp up a little bit on its industrial production. Uh, so we've raised our, uh, our price outlook for, for iron ore, uh, getting above $140 a ton. Uh, in the interim, maybe going even higher. Uh, but given the cost of extracting iron ore, uh, we expect that by the end of the year, iron ore prices will level off and get down, back down to the $100 range. When we look at industrial metals, we are actually sh on the short side for the short term and on the long side for the long term. Uh, we've seen adequate inventories uh, in China uh, with their own slowdown. We've seen uh, a lack of demand in the short run. We've seen financial flows into the market that have recently raised the price, of not of all, but most metals. Uh, we think they've raised the price to a level that's not coincident, uh, not not at not really realistic in terms of the supply demand balances today. Uh, on the other hand, while we expect prices to come down from their highs uh, in the first quarter, we do think that by the end of the year, we think most industrial metals with perhaps the exception of aluminum, will be on the rebound. Uh, and indeed, we are very positive on most industrial metals, particularly the metals that have an important role to play in battery power. Uh, uh, and that includes copper uh, and aluminum eventually for purposes of wiring uh, in a world in which uh, electric vehicles and electrification in general and the distribution of electricity are becoming more important. But we have nickel and we have cobalt and manganese uh, and other battery metals, including lithium. Uh, uh, lithium may be the one uh, exception where uh, the demand is hitting the marginal price at the part at the end of the supply curve and the prices will go up. Uh, and we've really seen an inadequate amount uh, of investment on the on the metal side. I say the big exception is lithium, where prices have gone up uh, a significant amount over the last year. Uh, but uh, the cost of extracting lithium is a tiny fraction of the price in the marketplace, maybe one tenth of it at the moment on average. Uh, and that suggests that as more lithium is brought into the market, the price will have much more downward pressure, uh, unique among uh, the battery metals. Fair point. But uh, Ed, among the base material prices, the best bullish bet clearly continues to come in case of copper. What kind of demand supply scenario do you envision here? 
Uh, well, we, we um, envisage a uh, supply and demand scenario where the price of copper at the margin will grow above 9,000 and hit 10,000 uh, dollars a ton before long. So it's really looking at uh, where we think demand is coming from and what a supply curve is telling us. All right, that's a lot of non-agro commodities, but I do want to talk about the soft commodities and this was an year of highs and immense profits. What's your uh, best bet or what catches your eye for 2023 within softs? Well, it depends on what we're looking at. What catches our eye um, initially uh, is that uh, when we when we look at the grains complex, that um, the world was caught in a tight market when the Russia-Ukraine conflict started, uh, and then there were concerns about uh, everything from fertilizer and where it's going to come from uh, to what if there is a disruption uh, of uh, grain exports, corn and wheat from Ukraine, uh, and that falling into a shortage in uh, in Russia. And what the impacts for that going to be uh, on emerging market countries dependent upon uh, those uh, Russian and Ukrainian exports. Uh, and then we had bad weather in Brazil, bad weather in the United States. But as you know, uh, and we had one other thing, we had countries, including India, that put a ban on the exports of softs in particular, in order to preserve a lower price in a domestic market. But a lot of that is easing, uh, particularly on the grain side, a little bit more complicated when it comes to the other softs, when it comes to sugar and uh, coffee and cocoa and the like. Uh, but still we see, as a result of higher prices, more acreage uh, under cultivation seasonally in both uh, Latin America uh, and uh, Australia and other parts of the Southern Hemisphere, uh, and then uh, followed by more acreage under cultivation uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. Undoubtedly, we don't know the level of drought in the, in the future. Brazil has come out of its drought, a mid-continent of the U.S. has come out of its drought, and Europe has come out of its drought. So uh, the weather looks more favorable, uh, and we think the prospects are, uh, for most softs, neutral to bearish. All right, that's good news, at least from the food inflation part of it, that most soft commodities could be looking at neutral to bearish cues coming in for 2023. Ed Morse, always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us with your sense on all of those commodities. And with that, it's a wrap on this edition of Commodity Champions. Thank you for watching.